Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. My name is Sean, and I manage a publication on Medium titled Coping with Capitalism. It's an honor to speak with you all on a topic as ubiquitous as capitalism. In a system based on exploitation, the issues that we face today are byproducts of its very design. While these realities can be overwhelming, it's important to remember that we are not powerless. Today, I'd like to share a few paths towards self and collective care that can help us reclaim our well being. As we explore these paths, it's important to recognize that capitalism is more than just an economic system. It's a force that shapes nearly every aspect of our lives. Talking about capitalism can be so deeply personal and at the same time, so universally impactful. Each of us has our own experience with capitalism and our own ways of surviving in the system. I stand here today not as an expert, but as someone who has lived through these challenges and continues to grapple with them. It's a privilege for me to use my voice. There are many people who are silently struggling and even dying at the hands of capitalism. I live in San Francisco where the median household income is roughly 83% higher than the national average. I've seen shops offer discounted food to tech workers for showing their work badge, while unhoused individuals sat outside their shop struggling to find any food. This struggle extends to marginalized communities who have historically been and continue to be disproportionately targeted and affected by the inequities of the system. To have this opportunity to be a voice to the voiceless is not taken for granted. At the end of the speech, if you have any additional insights to share about this topic, please do. Changing the system isn't just an individual's responsibility, it's a collective one. We all have such unique perspectives to share here. It's necessary to share these perspectives because there is no one size fits all approach to cope with capitalism. What works for me may not work for you. My hope is that by sharing our experiences and insights, we can find ways to support each other on this journey. To understand why coping with capitalism is necessary, let's take a moment to reflect on what capitalism really means for us as individuals. At its core, capitalism is driven by the pursuit of profit. It rewards greed even at the expense of our well being, the planet, and humanity. For many of us, it means relentless pressure. We're expected to perform, to produce, and to consume day in and day out. In this system, our value is tied to our ability to contribute towards upholding the system. This constant drive can leave us feeling exhausted, depleted, and disconnected from what truly matters. It's crucial to recognize that the pressures of capitalism are not evenly distribu distributed. Historically, capitalism has been deeply intertwined with systems of oppression, racism, sexism, classism, ableism, and colonial colonialism, just to name a few. These systems perpetuate inequality and exploitation in ways that continue to shape our world. For example, let's consider the historical exploitation of Black and Indigenous people through slavery and colonialism. These injustices were essential to the development of capitalism. Capitalism's earliest form thrived on the forced labor and land stolen from these communities. This generated immense wealth for a few while oppressing the many. This exploitation, exploitation set the stage for the inequalities that we see today, where racial and economic disparities continue to exist and divide our society. The exploitation within the system isn't just economic, it's emotional and psychological too. We're often asked to sacrifice our time, our energy, and even our integrity to meet the demands of the system. This exploitation can manifest in many ways, low wages, precarious job security, overwork, and the erosion of our work-life balance. The toll that this takes on our mental and physical health cannot be overstated. This is why coping with capitalism is not just important, it's essential. The stress, anxiety, and burnout that so many of us experience are not just individual issues, they are systemic. If we don't develop ways to care for ourselves and each other, the impact of the system will be devastating. Coping is more than just surviving. It's about finding ways to thrive even in the face of adversity. These strategies that I'm going to share are forms of resistance. They allow us to push back against the pressures of capitalism and to protect what's most important, 
our health, our communities, and this planet. Let's explore three paths of self-care using stories from the publication. Path number one, reclaim your time and prioritize rest. In Ash Bunny's story, Our Productivity is Killing Us, she emphasizes the necessity of stepping back from the relentless drive towards productivity and to instead focus on our well-being. She writes, to pursue equilibrium and move towards sustained wellness, I had to embrace radical rest. By embracing radical rest, we give ourselves the space to recover, reflect, and restore balance in our lives. This approach isn't just about physical rest, it's about allowing ourselves the mental and emotional space to recharge. Path number two, engage in radical self-acceptance. Annika highlights the importance of hobbies as a form of self-acceptance and reclaiming our time from societal pressures in her story. I'm good at hobbies, but not at working. Annika writes, in a world where we are constantly pressured to be productive every second, Hobbies are a way to reclaim our lives outside of working hours. By engaging in activities that bring us joy while aligning with our true selves, we resist the external demands for productivity. This path encourages us to embrace who we are while validating our worth through the pursuit of personal passions rather than external achievements. Path number three, strengthen emotional resilience through self-compassion. I've shared my own journey of embracing the full spectrum of my emotions and my story, what is your why, as a powerful reminder to practice self-compassion. Over time, or I write, over time, my awareness of the depth of my capacity to feel has profoundly grown. I've learned to allow myself to fully experience each feeling while embracing its impermanence. By allowing ourselves to experience our feelings without judgment, we build emotional resilience and the capability to nurture our well-being. This path is about recognizing our emotions as valid and using self-compassion as a tool to navigate life's challenges. Now that we've explored what we can do as individuals, let's explore three paths of collective care using, again, stories from the publication. Path number one, build compassionate and inclusive communities. In Ashley Crouch's story, The Antidote to Capitalism is Community, she emphasizes the importance of community as a remedy for the isolating effects of capitalism. Ashley writes, my remedy for coping with life in a capitalist society is to continue centering community and relationships in my life. I am nothing without the people who stood by me or guided me to where I am today. To foster collective care, we must actively build and maintain compassionate communities that prioritize relationships over individualism. This involves creating spaces where people can connect, share, and support each other, whether through local initiatives, communal living, or simply by being present with one another. Path number two, demand holistic health care that prioritizes well-being over profit. And Dr. Emanuel's story, playing Russian roulette with mental health patients, he spotlights the deep flaws of our healthcare system where profit-driven motives overshadow the need for comprehensive care. Dr. Emmanuel writes, mental illness is costing the world about $2.5 trillion per year. Untreated mental illness will trap people in poverty and homelessness, reduce the patient's chances of employment, and place enormous burdens on family members. In a capitalist society that thrives on stress, Collective care means demanding a healthcare system that addresses the whole person, both mind and body. We must advocate for a system that ensures access to effective mental health treatments like psychotherapy while addressing the root causes of chronic illnesses linked to lifestyle choices and societal stresses. By advocating for policies that prioritize well being over profit, we can challenge a system that profits from our suffering and work toward a society where health is a fundamental right for all, not a privilege for the few. Path number three, resisting alienation through shared political activism. Lucas speaks to the exhaustion and necessity of political activism in his story, To Cope with Capitalism, One Must Fight It. Lucas writes, we all need to look at look out for our mental health and a system that assaults it by its very design, but inaction isn't the solution. 
To practice collective care, we should engage in shared political activism that challenges the system. By joining forces with others who share similar values, we can create movements that not only fight for systemic change, but also provide mutual support to maintain our mental and emotional well beings. As we navigate the challenges of living in a capitalist society, it's vital to remember that we are not alone in the struggle. The paths to self and collective care shared today are not just strategies for survival, they are acts of resistance against a, against a system that thrives on our exploitation. I invite you all to take what resonates and create inspired action. True liberation exists beyond capitalism. Individually, we are a drop, but together we are the ocean. Let's support one another, share our experiences, and continue to envision a world where everyone has the opportunity to thrive. The change we seek begins with us right here, right now. Together, we will co-create a more inclusive and supportive world for all. Thank you for your time. If you'd like to read any of the stories that I've shared today, please visit my profile page on Medium at Sean Jr. or Sean Jr. Um, this speech is already published on my profile with links to each story. Uh, thank you again for being here today. If anyone has any questions or comments, now is the time to share. See one question in the QA, so I'm going to address that. Uh, Beth Castillo wrote, I think about this, however, I think it is too big to fail. For instance, I live in a small agricultural community near the Mexican border. Sometimes in order to keep it, the few stores we have open and to provide job security, I buy items I don't need. What options do we have? That was a really good question. Um, that are you still in the chat? Could you expand on this question a bit in terms of what do you mean by what options do we have? Awesome. If you could write in the chat or another q and I would love to talk more about this. Gotcha. Things that are essential, but we support how it affects our community. Um, I think that what you're doing uh, is great to really use your um, dollar as a form of social responsibility and supporting these local shops to help keep them open and to provide job security in your local community. I think that's uh, one of the paths that we as consumers have to begin to constantly take. It, it's so easy for many people to support larger corporations that aren't interested in supporting local communities that are just truly interested in retaining wealth and creating more opportunities for wealth. So that's a start in that direction of being responsible with our dollar. And I know that for some of us, we live in areas where we might live in like a food desert or we don't have the right access to, uh, or we don't have as much of an access to local um, resources or shops. Like these larger corporations are the only options. And that's where I feel like um, there are various platforms that we can uh, support that are trying to bridge those gaps. A few of those have been spotlighted on the publication. I'm going to move on to Philip's question. What's it like in the Bay Area right now? Um, 
it was a little bit foggy and rainy earlier, but it's pretty sunny. I'm not sure if you're talking about from a weather perspective, but if you have more that you would like to share there, I can happily expand. Um, I'm going to move on to Mara's question. Would you please talk about your views on collaborations between labor, human rights, civil rights, and climate, organizing as a resistance to capitalism? Yeah, I think that, uh, Mara, there's a lot of issues that are very interconnected to each other. So solving for one issue, you're inherently going to come across equally just as important issues in other spaces. That's why my approach with the publication has been really like based around advocacy and spotlighting each other and uplifting each other and calling out these interdependencies and the interconnected uh, nature of the issues that we face today. So I think that it's great to try to solve for these issues as a resistance to capitalism. But I think that a lot of these issues are really pointing to capitalism as being a major driver in terms of perpetuating the issue and keeping that issue um, alive. And I think that it's kind of highlighting the need for a more equitable system. So I think it's great to continue to connect the dots and to interleague struggles towards each other, because one that's highlighting the actual reality of a lot of these issues. But secondly, it's allowing us opportunities to find community, to build community, and to better support each other. Charles asked me to, uh, to post the link before I signed off. I shared it, but I'll share it again right now. Georgina has a question. What do you think about actions like four-day work weeks, more part-time and remote options, reset economy, social programs, incentives for parents who stay at home? I think those are all great ideas, Georgina. Um, I also think that it's, I think there was actually like, some like research done on like a four day work week and seeing just as equal levels of productivity. Um, oh, I'm sorry about that. I wasn't sending the link to the full chat. Um, but yeah, just highlighting that four day work weeks can be just as productive, just as profitable, um, but of course much better for our mental health. So I personally am a fan of those um, paths, but I also do think that they start to move us towards a um, system that isn't so, so uh, solely focused on efficiency of creating wealth, um, but one that really prioritizes our well-beings. And I don't think that capitalism is something that can accommodate for that. There's more questions, please add them in the Q&A section if anyone wants me to talk more about any of the previous questions, I'm happy to do so. If anyone has anything that they would like to share, I'm happy to uh, spotlight anyone else's comments as well. And just so folks know, um, the um, Chat isn't the Q&A section. I'm not sure if Medium staff could help with directing people on how to use the Q&A functionality. Um, but another question just came in, so I'll answer that. Um, Eric 
uh, suggestions for cultivating community. Um, I think a great way of doing that is by beginning with self-work and self-inquiry into what are your passions and what are things that you connect with, what are things that you believe in, and using that as a kind of compass to um, understand what communities should you try to connect with because um, I've learned in my own personal experience that when I've began to take those steps that there are just a ton of communities out there and a lot of them are kind of established as these like silos that don't really talk to each other and for some communities that's a benefit um, a lot of marginalized communities have been just oppressed and what folks in those communities need is more of a safe space to share their experiences to heal um, but I, I do think that in this pursuit of cultivating community it's great to start with your passions it's great to also recognize that just because you might be in, really invested into one topic that you can't also uh, participate in another I, I think that that's um just not true but yeah i would start with your passions eric jorge asked the question how do you see a non-capitalist approach to avoiding climate apocalypse i think that um when it comes to like a climate apocalypse like one of the biggest drivers towards that is our consumption patterns. Um, so I'm, I'm sure many of you remember when the pandemic uh, happened and there was just this halt of activity, halt of cars, halt of airplanes. A lot of these things that are releasing emissions into the atmosphere, uh, whether from our own means of travel or the distribution of goods and there was clear effects of our positive effects on the planet um, during that time we, we live on a planet that self-regulates that literally heals itself and our consumption patterns are throwing off that equilibrium so i think one approach jorge is to really be mindful of our consumption patterns to really consider, is this necessary at this moment? Do I really need this object? What? How did this object even get to the city? Do I really want to support a company that uses those methods? Um, it's. I'm not sure if it's as non-capitalist as you're hoping for, but I think having that awareness and bring that into action is a great first step. True Wealth asks, how do we increase perceived value as writers? I think that's a really interesting question uh, because of course with like on medium value is attributed to what you provide in terms of content. And I think that that's something that we need to really like rethink is what is the content that we are gravitating towards and what is it that we truly value i know that in a lot of media outlets what most people will kind of spotlight are or is this like sensationalization of um, violence of fear and whatever is just like a clickbait title that will get views and engagement i think we need to really define what it is that we find valuable, what it is that we want to write about, what it is that we want to read, and what it is that we want to consume, and continue to share that and continue to support each other while in doing so. Um, Mickey asked, what is my background and inspiration for this pursuit? Uh, I, I studied at design, and I'm I practice design currently at the moment. Um, specifically, I studied industrial design, which is 
essentially product design. So it's very much tied to the market and um, tied to whether that's the product's life cycle of how do we extract resources for this idea? How do we manufacture this product? How do we market it? What do we do after it's used? It's, it's, um, I was able to really consider that full uh, life cycle in, in, in school and in practice. And I think just that experience really showed to me just one, how wasteful a lot of our processes are. Um, a lot of designers are touted as being innovative when in reality they're creating waste that's going to be detrimental to our generation generations to come and i just never understood why that was something that was um celebrated and the like idea of a designer is very much based on like the individual their taste their skill and i it just never felt right for me to pursue that kind of lifestyle for myself. I um, really see the value in community and communal living and building communities and nourishing communities. So my exposure to that world um, kind of gave me this reaction of, actually, this is not the direction that I want to go in. I want to do something else. Um, Georgina shares that they live on an Indian reserve and it's definitely an issue to steer our youth away from capitalist ideals. Culture and language are a good tool for our communities where outside influences like technology are self-governing. What do I think of this issue? Um, I think that's a really good call out, Georgina, um, around these like tools for community and the influences of things like technology and how it is self-governing, which means that it could be this, and we have a minute left, so this is probably going to be the last uh, question that I get to, but if you have more questions or would love to just chat with me, definitely reach out to me on Medium. I will happily respond. Um, but with a tool like technology that's self-governing, um, I think that's where we need to um, really consider how do we uh, introduce these tools to the youth in terms of like children and how do we find a balance between our use with technology as a tool and not as an all-encompassing entity where we spend so much of our time on it we become wrapped up in what's on social media we become wrapped up with trends I think we have to begin with ourselves of creating that balance uh, with technology and other influences like social media and share what's working for us and not as a way to like, not as like a dogma for others to rigidly follow, but as a way to highlight the benefits that come when we, when we do that. So yeah, thank you all again for joining. Um, if you want to reach out to me, again, please do so on Medium. We'll happily answer any questions. Thank you.